Good morning, guys. How y'all doing? If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Andrew, and I'm one of the pastors here on staff. Let me invite you up front to go ahead and grab your Bibles, pull out your Bibles, and we are going to get there in just a moment. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning or you don't own a Bible, I would invite you to raise your hand, and one of our ushers would love to bring you a Bible. This is a gift from us to you. We truly love when you guys bring your Bibles, and we wish that everybody would bring it and have it in their hands so they can follow along, highlight, take notes, use it throughout the week. So if you want a Bible, just raise your hand. Again, it's a gift yours to have and to keep. We we are in week three of our traction series, which is all about gaining and maintaining spiritual momentum. The first week, we talked about the importance of having a goal, of working toward growing in our faith on purpose. And we talked about the four different elements of a goal, that in order for you to gain and maintain spiritual momentum, you have to first identify where it is you want to go. And then you need to understand your objectives. What are the things in front of you? You have to put together an action plan, and then ultimately, with accountability, you've got to live it out. Last week, we talked about the importance of celebrating the wins along the way. It's important when you are working to gain and maintain spiritual traction or, or momentum that you're able to look back in those times where you begin to slip, in those times where you begin to lose traction, and be reminded of God's faithfulness, of God's graciousness, of God's love. And we talked about Samuel we looked at 1 Samuel uh, and, 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 and the story of the Israelites worshiping God as the Philistines started coming in. After 20 years of idol worship, they had repented and they went up to worship. And the Philistines caught wind that they were doing this. And while the Israelites were worshiping, they began to panic and saying, we're, we, are, we are outnumbered and, and we don't have arms. We should take up arms. And Samuel said, no, 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 no. Don't, don't take up sword or spear. Lean into God all the more. And the Lord took care of them in battle as they worshiped. And they built an Ebenezer there, the place where God was victorious, the place where God provided. And we looked at a few examples throughout Scripture where they would build these monuments with the understanding of the idea that as people would walk by them for generation after generation, they would be able to look back and say, what's that? That's where the Lord provided. That's where God was gracious. That's where the Lord was strong. That's where we had victory in battle because of the Lord. And we talked about celebrating the wins. And then you heard from a few of our team leaders about the amazing things that we are excited about going on at our church. And they went outside to baptize 20 people. It came to my attention even this last week as we were uh, talking about what happened last week. I had uh, at least five people this week already tell us that they are ready to get baptized. So that is an exciting exciting way to celebrate what God is doing in their lives and ministry. So again, Pastor Alex just talked about it, but let me reiterate, if baptism, going public with your faith, is something you're interested in, we would love for you to take time at the end of the service near one of the end of your rows and grab a connection card, fill it out and indicate, let us know that you're interested in baptism and one of our team leaders would contact you and let you know all about it and answer any questions you have. Today, we are going to pick up week three and we're going to be talking about the importance of grit the importance of, of working, uh, working hard and bearing down. You're, I'm excited. Uh, several months ago, we began the process of looking for, identifying, and hiring a youth pastor. And it was quite a lengthy process, very intentional process that involved a lot of steps and a lot of individuals that were partnering with us in this. As we began the process, I... Uh, put out on, on uh, it's called LinkedIn, and then some church staffing websites that we were looking for this position or this person. And I had a guy contact me who owns and operates and manages a company called Kingdom Candidates, and they are all about helping identify and equip and raise up individuals for ministry. And he said, hey, man, I've been checking out your ministry from a distance and love what you guys are doing. I'm excited. I'd love to help you. No cost to the church whatsoever. I just, I just feel like I would love to jump in and help you guys with your search. And so Jared and I began to build a fast friendship. We have a lot of things in common, a lot of affinities. And as we began to talk and work together, we quickly identified our youth pastor, Jeff. And so I'm about to introduce my friend Jared here in just a moment. 
And Jared is a graduate of Fuller Seminary. He is a, a, a pastor. He is a father. He is uh, one of the best lacrosse players to ever play the game in the country. He's a two-time national champion for Virginia and then gave up. He actually was going to play professional lacrosse and walked away from the game to pursue full-time ministry. Uh, he actually knows our worship pastor, Alex. They served at different churches at the same time in Bozeman, Montana. And so there's this weird thing with Montana going on because if you know anything about our youth pastor, he also wrestled at, at Bozeman, Montana. He wrestled at Montana State. And so there's this, this Montana theme we got going on. Not on purpose, but it's kind of cool. I hear they've got great fishing. So one of these guys is going to prove it. Um, but I'm excited to introduce here Jared in just a moment to have him come up and to share the message. Church, would you please welcome my friend and fellow pastor, Jared Little, to the stage today. with you all today. I've been looking forward to coming and presenting God's word to you. I'm just going to give you a heads up. Uh, I have been told that I have a fiery preaching style and uh, more or less a prophetic preaching style. And if you think of that story of Jesus on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection, post-resurrection, he's walking with a few of his disciples. And the disciples don't recognize Jesus, they're, but they're walking, and Jesus, what's he's, what he's doing is, is he's opening the scriptures to them. He's telling them about who he is. And then in the middle of this, he up and disappears, he goes away. And the disciples, they say to themselves, whoa, did not our hearts burn within us while he opened the scriptures, while he spoke? And so I hope as I preach and teach today with you all that you start feeling this, this sense of anticipation, this burning, this energy where you hold on to your seats and you're like, ah. Oh. I, I, I once had this older gentleman, he was an elder at our church in Bozeman, Montana, came up to me after I preached and he said, Jared, I love your preaching style, but can you do me a favor? Whenever you're slotted to preach, can you let me know in advance? He goes, because I need to get ready and wear my sweatpants. <laughs> I put my arm around him, I laughed, and I said, I will do just that. But here's the thing. If you come in sweatpants, I'm going to preach so hard, I'm going to make you dance. <laughs> At which point he said, if you're going to make me dance, I'm going to go spend some time with the Heavenly Father sooner than I anticipate. <laughs> so I hail from Los Angeles, the city of angels. One of the things I think when people think about Los Angeles is that it's superficial. How many get that? Like Hollywood, slick haircuts, urban beardsmen. <laughs> As a pastor friend of mine describes a conversation he had with a local artist, he asked the local artist, do you think Los Angeles is superficial? And the artist says, no, man, no, no, no. Los Angeles, we're Deeply superficial. <laughs> to prove my point, Mr. Andrew Anderson, when he asked me to preach, he says, I got, I got to ask you one thing, though. I, I'm glad you'll come and you're accepting my invitation, but how's your theology? Can I trust your theology? You, you are from California. <laughs> and I, I tell you what I tell him is, I'm going to open the scriptures faithfully to you all today. Amen. You're in this traction series. Andrew talked about you got to have a goal to gain momentum. You got to know where you're going. You got to have objections. You got to have an action plan. And part of having an action plan isn't just executing your vision, but you got to know who's with you. Amen? And then you got to live it out. And part of living it out and executing your goal is you got to celebrate the wins, which you all just did. It's good. You got to do that because it keeps you going. It gives you momentum. It keeps momentum. And so I want to preach today and keep encouraging you to keep moving forward. I'm going to push you. I'm going to strengthen you, strengthen you. But I want to get you today to make an investment that will pay off. 
an investment in yourself that will pay off. I want to make accomplishing God's plan for your life more interesting and more motivating. Well, why do I speak about motivation? Why do I, why do I, why do you need to stay motivated? Let's be honest. In life, sometimes it's hard to have the, the, the requisite amount of energy and passion to get through our day. We set New Year's resolutions, but sometimes two, three months in, those resolutions drop by the way. The demands of life, at times, can we all say this? It exceeds exceeds our capacity. Like we come home from a hard hard day's work, we see our kids, we're physically present with them, but we're emotionally and mentally checked out even though part of our goal is to love our family more. Am I the only one that that experiences this? We survive on too little sleep. Like kids are down, I'm gonna stay up and I'm, I'm gonna crack a beer and I'm gonna watch my TV until midnight. Because I need some time for myself. Only, only problem is I wake up the next day and I'm exhausted. We get fast food on the run. We're not always thinking about what we eat. Or because we're, our, our life is so fast paced, we don't really eat at all. We fuel up on coffee, cool down on alcohol. Or for some of us, we take sleeping pills, and I get it. Like, I take sleeping pills sometimes. I've been there. I haven't slept in two days. I, gotta, I need some help tonight. Or we skip the gym. We don't take care of our, ourselves physically because we're not sleeping well. See, we make expedient decisions throughout our days that make us tired emotionally, physically, spiritually. And all these little itty bitty decisions, they take a toll over time. It leaves us short tempered easily distracted, and I already mentioned this, we're not physically and emotionally present with our families because we're giving our best to work. So if you don't have the tools in place today that I'm gonna give you, that I believe scripture gives us, your plan, your goal, will fail. In the least, it'll take longer to get to accomplishing that goal. And the reason is, we we all get exposed to storms in life. Do we not? Sickness, disease, death of loved ones, betrayal, disappointments, People are doing things on the side and work. They're saying X, and y, X, Y, and Z about your boss. Certain things, they take a toll on you. Your kids get in trouble. Ah, oh, things were going so good. Now I gotta go deal with this with my kid. How do we get through this? How do we manage ourselves in a way that we can get to our goal, accomplish our goal, How do do we do that? How do you manage yourself daily? Does the scripture speak to that? My answer is, I think it does. For us to perform at a high capacity, for you to perform at a high capacity to execute your, your plan, what I say, to access your future day in and day out, you have to have grit. Grit. There's two definitions of grit. One is the, the ability to persevere in pursuing a future goal over a long period of time. Angela Duckworth has, has written a, a decent book called Grit. And this is what she says. She says, grit is having passion and perseverance toward long-term goals. Passion, perseverance. Now, I'm a coach. I also run a lacrosse club in Los Angeles. 
have over 100 kids playing in it. Middle school up through high school, boys and girls. And when I look at athletes, my high caliber athletes, they're gritty and they're tough. But then I also look at them and I know myself, played lacrosse at the University of Virginia, there are days that I don't perform well. There are days that I don't accomplish my goal. I played five years at the University of Virginia, was medically redshirted once, only won a national championship twice. And I say only, some people are like, oh, that's amazing, I didn't even win one. But we had a goal every year to win a national championship. So I think grit is actually, I agree, it's, it's, it's passion and energy to accomplish a goal, but it's more than that. It's a byproduct. It's a byproduct of taking care of yourself physically. It's a byproduct of taking yourself mentally. It's a byproduct of taking care, your, taking care of yourself emotionally and spiritually. See, there's four pillars that I believe lead to grit. And I think scripture proves this. So what's grit? It's a commitment to love God with your emotions, to love God with your body, with your mind, with your, and with your spirituality. Without the right amount of physical conditioning, without the right amount of mental training and emotional well-being and spiritual exercise, exercising your faith, without these things, you will, I, I promise, you're going to be compromised in anything that you do. And we don't want to live compromised lives. Matthew 22, verses 37 to 40. I'll give you a little background on this. These Pharisees came to Jesus as a group, and they had a lawyer speak for them. See, they came as a, 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 as a, group, a group of one, having one to speak for them, and they asked Jesus, hey, what's the greatest commandment? See, they didn't realize that though they came as a group of one, they were about to be introduced to the power of one. And you know what Jesus says to them? Here's the greatest command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. If you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. It says the second is love your neighbor as yourself. And that after that comes all the other commandments. All the other commandments hang on, hang on these. So we're going to unpack this. If you want to live a gritty life, you want to access your future day in, day out, we're going to talk about our bodies, our minds, our emotions, and our spirituality. But before we do that, will you pray with me? Father God, I thank you so much for this opportunity to preach your word. You are good and faithful. I believe you want to empower us today and give us your words and your wisdom so that we may live out your dreams for us. Speak through me, God. Come into my body, out of my mouth, and into the hearts and lives of these folks that make up Country Bible Church. In your name, amen. Now Jesus, this, this greatest commandment, this greatest commandment to love God with all of you are, is the Shema, Deuteronomy 6. And the Pharisees, who were experts in the law, would have known what Jesus was referencing when he said that. They were thinking about all the commandments, and Jesus is just simplifying it. Love God with all that you are. The Shema reads like this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Another translation says the, the Lord is one. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. There it is. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're resting at home, and when you are on the, on the road, when you're active and going. Talk about them when you're going to bed, when you're resting, 
and when you're getting up, when you're active. It's kind of like the physical body. As you go to the gym and stress it, you rip muscles. How do you rebuild those muscles? You rest it. You rest your body. It says, tie these commands around your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. This is the mental. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The physical. It's all around you. It's all consuming. Verse 10. The Lord your God will soon bring you into the land he swore to give you when he made a vow to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As you follow these, I'm going to take you into the promised land. And there, the houses will be richly stocked with goods you did not produce. You will draw water from cisterns you did not dig. Can everyone say provision? You will eat from vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. Can everyone say provision? When you have eaten your fill in this land, be careful. Be careful not to forget the Lord who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. What is Jesus saying to to these Pharisees? What's he saying to us? Jesus is saying there are certain commands that are great, but there is one there's one, there's certain commands that are great, but there's only one that is primary. Everything else is secondary. Love God with all that you are. Love him with your entire being. Not some faculties not, and not others. You don't get to just love him with your mind. God wants everything. He wants your emotions. He wants the epicenter of who you are to love him. The purpose of the law was to bring the Israelites out of a state of paganism into a whole life worship of God. And Jesus is reminding the Pharisees of this. Jesus is saying the Shema is the great commandment. It's first of all, and it's the very one which followed, Jesus says this in John, that will lead to life, that will lead to grit. We need energy and passion every day, every single day. And it starts with these four pillars. The Shema encapsulates all of God's savings intentions and his provisions. His intentions and provisions. I have loved you. I have loved all of you, every part of you, all four of these pillars. Therefore, obey me with all that you are, and I will provide for you. Great and good cities you didn't build. Olive trees you didn't plant, but you're going to reap from that. Provision, and all you got to do is give me all that you are. The Shema is one biblical scholar. He describes it like this. It's more than a command. It's what makes life possible. It's It's the energy and passion. It's the grit. Cyril of Alexandria says, to love God with the whole heart is the cause of every other good. Provision. Origin, one of the founding fathers of the the Christian church, says, worthy is a person confirmed in all all his or her gifts who exalts in the wisdom of God, having a heart full of the love of God, a soul completely enlightened by the lamp of knowledge, and a mind filled with the word of God. Heart yourself, your mind, your body, all one, like the Trinity, God the Father, Spirit, Jesus the Son, who's a body, the Holy Spirit, God is knowledge, all of this in one, triune, we have all these components to us that are one to worship God. The Shema it's a word from, from Christ, from God, for an entire people. So country, country Bible Church, you are to love God as a body with your mind, with your heart, with your faith, your spirituality. Amen? As a complete body. But this is also individualistic. This is what we each have a responsibility to do. We're to love God with our essence Cardia is the epicenter of the heart, epicenter of the human being, but cardia is also the root word of cardiologist, 
When you go to a cardiologist, do you ask him to pray for you? No, you want him to fix you. You're supposed to love him with your essence and your expression. Amen? Your expression. See, the mind cannot speak, but you can speak your mind. You feel me on that? So we're going to learn to manage our bodies, our emotions, our minds, and, and, our, and, our, and our spirituality, our faith. Because in doing that, it will have a profound impact on how you stick to your future day in, day out. So we're going to start with emotions. Before, but before we get into emotions, I want to tell you a little story about my son. I have three kids, six, four, and two. You can pray for me now. A son and, and two daughters. My wife is brilliant, has a genius mind, legitimately a genius mind. She is a very successful executive, was on a business trip to Seattle. So I was home alone with the kids. I receive your prayers. <laughs> and the first night she was gone, I was in bed sound asleep, and my children usually come in around midnight, a little bit after. I heard my son come in. He gets into bed, and I'm kind of in a fog, and I know he's there, and for all I know, I, I fell back to sleep. All of a sudden, I feel these little hands on my face, okay? They're on my face, and I feel wiggle it around, and he pulls it over, and he goes, Dad, Dad, there's somebody in the house, I was, what? He goes, Dad, there's somebody in the house. And I briefly looked out my room. The door was open. The lights were on in the living room, which I knew I turned them off. And I was like, no. And then his sister popped up. Boop. Didn't, I didn't even know she was in the bed. <laughs> she pops up. She goes, yeah, he's right there. Okay, at this point, I don't know about you, you know, you, you may, like Andrew, suffer from hypermasculinity. Okay? I got scared. Okay, fear entered my body. My emotions started going. This is how your emotions are connected to the body. I hopped up like a ninja. Pop! On my bed. This is a true story. I pop up on my bed. I'm like, okay, my son says someone's in the house. My daughter says he's right there. And I, what's, all that's going through my mind is I'm blind as a bat. Okay, I have contacts in right now. So I'm in ninja mode. And my daughter sees right there, and all I see is we have this big mirror. It's about seven feet tall. It's in the corner of our bedroom. And I'm thinking to myself, he knows I'm up like a ninja and ready to go. He's hiding behind the mirror. But then I'm like, if he comes at me, I'm not going to even see it coming. So I have a choice here. Get ready to fight and get knocked out. Or go get my glasses and abandon my children. I totally abandoned my children. <laughs> I went and checked the house. I walked around the house looking for this so-called man. And what it was was, actually, that night I had been, been uh, preaching, or sorry, preparing for this sermon, brought a, one of our, ta our chairs into the room. It was a, it's a tall chair. And my daughter saw it, and she thought it was a person. My son was convinced it was a person. Everything was fine, okay? So I brought my emotions back into check. But I tell you that story because can you imagine if I'd stayed in a state of fear and anxiety? Would that have been good or healthy for me? Yeah, it would have been terrible. So gritty people, they stick to their future day in and day out because they love God with their emotions. Seek, the word Jesus used there is the root, root, root word of Psychology. It's the seed of feelings, desires, affections, aversions. And they can communicate deep truths about who you are and how life affects you. Dan Allender, if you're looking for good books on marriage, I recommend reading, reading Dan Allender, by the way. He says, deal with emotions and you will deal with your daily reality. Ignore emotions and you will turn your back on reality. Emotions are the flags uh, that explain the depths of who you are. See, God communicates to us in the feeling realm. If you want to know who you are, get to know your emotions. Amen? And in the process, you're going to get to know the king of the universe. Augustine, he says this, 
How can you draw close to God when you're far from yourself? And he says this prayer, grant, Lord, that I may know myself, that I might know thee. St. Teresa of Avila says, almost all the problems in the spiritual life, faith, that's a pillar, stem from a lack of self-knowledge. Peter Scazzaro, in Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, says this, speaking on the inability of people to to deal with emotions. says, if you don't deal with your, your emotions, it does violence to yourself, it does violence to people around you, and ultimately it does violence to your relationship with God. You want to hurt people? Just don't deal with your emotions. Your emotions are real. People, you hear this saying, emotions aren't real. It's not, they're, they're not your reality. No, they're very, very real. They're exceptionally real. And they affect us. There's positive emotions. There's actually two kinds of positive emotions that, that, from what I can tell. I'm not a counselor. Emotions are measured in quality. They're negative or positive. Two type of positive ones. There's positive, positive emotions such as uh, bringing joy, that bring joy and peace to your life, that make you happy. Fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, peace, patience kindness, kindness. There's also healthy negative emotions, which are positive. Sadness at an event. Sadness at the loss of a loved one. Rational emotional responses to, to adverse events. When something bad happens, it's normal to be sad. But here's the thing, emotions. Think of emotions as energy in motion. There, God put these things in us to, to, to direct us to him and to keep us moving forward. Energy in motion. Unhealthy negative emotions are those that bring death, turmoil, disquiet, spiritual turbulence. They sabotage your ability to move forward. Feel where I'm going with that? Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. The day, has enough, day, the day has enough worries in itself. Don't be filled with anxiety. If you're filled with anxiety, what that is is you're, you're like Pinocchio, up on strings, you can't move forward. Because all you see is the problem. You're not focusing on God. All you see is the emotion. You're overwhelmed by the emotion. And these have negative effects on the body. Back pain, heart disease, sickness. They interfere with you moving forward. They're costly and efficient. We say, throw me some Bible. I'd love to. Proverbs 15, a hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he was slow to anger. Slow to anger quiets contention. Emotional health, it's, it's your ability to bounce back from disappointments. Are you emotionally healthy? Let me ask you this. Can you do a selective attention and pay attention to emotion? And then can you do a selective inattention? Can you rest your emotions? Talk about God when you go to bed, when you rest. Talk about God when you rise. There's a resting, there's an engaging part of emotions, and there's a part where we need to to rest those things. Sometimes we need to look at our emotions, or look away from our emotions, and look to the God who has emotions and receive his emotions. Amen? But if you pay attention to these emotions every day, and you get into them, Say, thank you, Lord, for teaching me this. Thank you for showing my anger, why I'm angry. I see that. I see I'm hurting people. I'm processing this. I'm moving forward. I'm talking to my friends. Selective attention. But now I need to go to work. Now I need to hit the gym and take care of myself. Selective inattention. Doesn't mean you're ignoring a problem. Do you feel me on this? My buddy David took out over $150,000 in debt between undergrad and seminary. $150,000. He had someone tell him, hey, we'll pay for your debt. You just concentrate on school. When the economy crashed, what do you think he was left with? All that debt, no one to pay it off. And he says, Jared, if I just pay attention to my debt, it's overwhelming. I'm angry. I made a terrible decision. If he just looked at that, do you think that would cripple him? Like that's going to affect, he's he's not married right now, but that's going to affect his future wife. That's pretty much a mortgage, depending on where you live in the country. But instead, he says, I I deal with it, I'm not happy with it, but I'm gonna keep moving forward. Energy in motion. How we worship God with our emotions is critical. Can we all say it, Can can we agree? Energy in motion. Our grit requires a healthy amount of emotional care. Two. 
Gritty people access their future day in and day out because they love God with their bodies. The Apostle Paul says, honor God with your bodies. Honor God with your bodies. Ironically, we're judged by more what we do with our minds than what we do with our body. If you go out to, an asso- to a social event, what's the first qu- question you ask somebody? How's work going? You come to church, hey, how's work? What do you do with your mind? Ironically, the very thing that we discount is the role of the human body and its connection to worshiping God. I get it, it's, it's really, it, it can be weird to ask people, are you hitting the gym? You look a little heavy, right? That's kind of a strange, depending on how close you are with someone, But we need to care for our body. It fuels our heart, our soul, and our mind. It leads to alertness, vitality. It affects how well we manage our emotions. You can actually sustain concentration better because you take care of yourself. Sleeping, resting, working out, and get this, according to the Apostle Paul, it helps us maintain our commitment to whatever mission we're on, accomplishing goals, 1 Corinthians 9.27, 9, I discipline my body like an athlete that I may not be disqualified after I preach. I discipline my body. Athletes, think about what they do. Professional athletes in particular. They build man, uh, routines in their life for managing their body, for taking care of themselves. How they eat, how they stress the body, how they rest the body to build it back up. And they do this because they have a vision and a goal to accomplish something. But get this, you and me, business people, professionals, pastors, nurses, doctors, psychologists, we go to work 8, 10, 12 hours a day, then we go engage our families. It's nonstop. See, the burden we carry on our bodies is actually more than a professional athlete. They go for months and months and months on end, and then they take several months break. And we're lucky if we get a vacation. Only if we decide, like, hey, this, I know this is good. I'm going to take the discipline and go on vacation and rest my body. So we need to take care of these bodies. We need to pay, pay attention to what we eat and how we stress this body. Getting to the gym. Folks that are, that are in their 50s and above, if you're staring down, you're, not, you're, you're closer to being elderly. Those that are, are, are elderly now... Physical fitness is proven to keep the heart healthy, but to, to increase bone density. Don't rob the church of your wisdom. We need your physical bodies in this church because we need your wisdom and knowledge. Us young bucks, we're, we're more energy than we are knowledge a lot of times. But I also want to speak to sleep, to rest. It's one of the most important sources of energy recovery. It affects our body temperature, hormone levels, heart rates. It's a period of when substantial growth and repair occurs. If we don't sleep well, what happens? Poor performance. It's hard to concentrate. I know I have these goals that I'm trying to accomplish, but I'll pick that up tomorrow because I'm exhausted. Winston Churchill, let's see if we can get a picture of him up. The old bulldog here. This is what he has to say about sleep. This guy who fought the Nazis. World War II. Led an entire country. Says you must sleep some time between lunch and dinner and no halfway measures. Take off your clothes and get into bed. Kind of weird. Says that's what I always do. Don't think you will be doing less work because you sleep during the day. That's a foolish notion held by people who have no imagination. You will be able to accomplish more. You get two days in one. Well, at least one and a half. When the war started, I had to sleep during the day because that was the only way I could cope with my responsibilities. We say, that's Churchill. Let me tell you about King David. This is what he says about sleep. I lie down and I sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. Look, can you guys say if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me? We need to take care of this body, but we need to rest this body. We need to stress and rest. Three, if you want to stick to your future day in and day out, you got to love love God with your mind. We got to engage this thing. R.C. Sproul, 
the late R.C. Sproul, a giant in the faith, recently passed away. He says this, the human mind is one of the most incredible aspects of creation. It's more powerful than the largest supercomputer and can solve great problems and make great discoveries. That makes the noetic effects of sin especially tra tragic. Now, noetic effects of sin has been the mental. The, our minds were, were disrupted by the fall because of sin. See, our minds have been seriously disturbed and corrupted because of the fall. And our natural tendency is to be really lazy with this thing. When I went back to, L to LA and I was no longer a full-time pastor, I was so busy launching two businesses, I had moments where I was just like, my God, I feel dumb. Because I wasn't engaging my mind, because I got so caught up in, in, in doing work, I stopped engaging my mind for a season. Yet we have a mandate from Scripture to use our minds. Because our ability to think has not been annihilated by the fall. The entire Christian life, our pilgrimage, is one in which we're supposed to seek God more and more with our, our minds. Can we say amen to that? Our mind, it's where we, where we figure out truth, false, false, the, the, tr truth and lies. And Jesus says, I want that thing. I want it directed completely to me. We need to do mental management. We need to focus on God so we can focus on life. If we don't focus on God, it's going to be a lot easier to, to give in to sin. Romans chapter 1, point in case. Though they saw me in creation, they did not know me or pursue me. And what did God do? He gave them over to the futility of their mind, meaning they naturally made poor, poor choices. It's our natural thing to do. So just like our body, just like our emotions, we need to stress and rest our mind. Romans 12, Paul says, renew your mind. Renew your mind. This way you'll be able to discern what is good and acceptable and perfect. Truth from lies. Let me say the church today, we need to be just powerhouses when it comes to knowledge of God. Because heresy is hitting the church like like wild, almost like the beginning of the church. You can't just depend on your pastors to be spiritual powerhouses and knowledgeable of God's word. You guys got to carry that burden too and demand it from him. Pull it out of us. Amen? We stress the mind because mental atrophy is a legitimate thing. One neuro neurologist says this, says, no matter how old you may be at this moment, it's never too late to change your mind for the better. That's because the brain is different from every other organ in our body. While the liver and the lungs and the kidneys wear out after a cer certain numbers of years, the brain gets sharper the more it's used. Indeed, it improves with use. Proverbs 3, don't let wisdom and understanding out of your sight. Pursue God. This way, when you lie down, you'll sleep well. It'll have a physical effect on your body. Read church doctrine. Read people who write the Bible, write about the Bible. Read the Bible, this book, read it. Also have fun with your mind. Scripture says to the, or, the creation mandate, mandate, be fruitful and multiply, exercise dominion over this earth, rule it. For me, that's like learning about beards. I'm gonna have the greatest beard in the world beard oils and shaping the beard. Learn new languages. Follow your passions. I think God looks down at those things and it brings him so much joy. But we also need to rest our mind. Rest your mind. Leonardo da Vinci, when he was commissioned to, to paint the Last Supper, we all know what this is. The people who hired him to work, they said, Leonardo... It looks like you're doing nothing. You're just walking around all the time and, and off in a daydream. He was off in la-la land. But he says this, the greatest geniuses sometimes accomplish more when they work less. And the reason is, is our mind is divided in two, the left logical side and the right, which is the creative side. One is engaged intentionally. The other one you kind of stare off. And, and I think that's when God speaks to us in a still small voice. And we're creative. You ever wonder why when you're in the shower, you, you have the greatest genius? 
It's typically because you've been thinking about something with your left brain, and then when you're in the, in, in the, in the shower and you're relaxing, you're at the gym running, or you're listening to music, all of a sudden, ah, oh, wow, the left side is engaged, the right side, and the rest, and all of a sudden you end up with creativity. This is important for us. Manage your mind. Last, I'm going to close with this. If you want to stick to your future day in and day out, you got to love God with your spirituality. That's faith in God. Do you see this book? The person that does not love it all, loves it not at all. This thing is, is your, your guide for life. Charles Spurgeon, a champion in the faith, says this, I would rather risk my soul with a guide inspired from heaven than with the differing, differing leaders who arise from the earth at the call of modern thought. Our faith, your spirituality, this fourth pillar, it's the catalyst for every other dimension in your life. It's the most powerful source of motivation, perseverance, and direction. It interests you in yourself. Remember, God loves you, all of you. You, oh, thank you, I receive that love. I will love you with all of me. It interests you in others. The second is the greatest, the second, and the, the second greatest command, love others as yourself. It interests you in others, this book, the G, Jesus, the God of the universe, and it interests you in himself. So it must be regularly renewed. Can we commit to that, regularly renewing our faith in God? It'll give you direction, and purpose. Amen? Now, some of you may say, I get these four pillars, but sometimes I don't want to engage my mind. Listen, don't let temporary setbacks lead to long, long-term excuses. Just because you get up one day, you have this goal, you say, I'm committing to these four pillars. If one of them gets taken out, bop, just like a table, the other three will keep it standing for a little while. But if you take out another leg, bah, that table's coming down. Your family rests on these four pillars. Your work rests on these four pillars. But, 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 the one essential that holds them all up is faith in Jesus Christ. I don't know where some of you are, some of you may need to recommit to, to loving God with your body, with your mind and your emotions. And other of you may say, you know what? I've had an abiding spirituality, but it's just been like accepting everything. One of the things I was warned about when I was in Los Angeles, I was doing catering at a, at a hotel on Rodeo Drive, which is like the rich of the rich of the richest. And someone asked, what do you do? And I was just like, oh, I'm in seminary, yada, yada, yada. And that person looked at me and said, be careful what you talk about. And I was like, why? You can't mention Jesus around here. And you know what I found out about Los Angeles? It's one of the most spiritual cities in, in our country. People long to hear truth. They're longing for it. Franklin Graham rolls into California and talks about how evangelicals need to take it back. And I want to tell you what scripture says is where one or two gather, there I am. And I'm telling you, we are there. We're there. Holding up this pillar of faith. And the body of Christ there is strong. But where are you with that? I want to pray for us right now. For the, that we can embody these pillars. Lord God, thank you for this chance to, to open your word and hear how you want all of us. Our mind, our bodies, our emotions, and you want us to put our spirituality, our faith in you. God, for anyone that needs to recommit to loving their bodies, recommit to loving their bodies and their mind and exercising their mind and their emotions and honoring you with that. God, I pray they do that. If someone comes to, you, to them and anyone in this room and says, you seem exasperated and angry, may we think about that as a gift. Say, God, what is it? What, help me know myself so that I can know you. If anyone in this room doesn't have an abiding faith in you, God, I pray right now that with their minds, they sing praises to you and say, God, with my mind, I accept you as my savior.
though physically sitting in a chair, I'm on my knees right now before you, acknowledging you as king of the universe. I want a successful life, God. I want your provision. I need it. My family's in trouble. I put my faith in you. All God's people said, amen.